Lesson 8 Comfort My People Sabbath Afternoon February 13 In the darkest days of her long conflict with evil, the Church of God has been given revelations of the eternal purpose of Jehovah. His people have been permitted to look beyond the trials of the present to the triumphs of the future, when, the warfare having been accomplished, the redeemed will enter into possession of the promised land. These visions of future glory, scenes pictured by the hand of God, should be dear to His Church today, when the controversy of the ages is rapidly closing and the promised blessings are soon to be realized in all their fullness. Soon we shall see Him in whom our hopes of eternal life are centered, and in His presence the trials and sufferings of this life will seem as nothingness. The former things shall not be remembered, nor come into mind. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come, will come, and will not tarry. Look up, look up, and let your faith continually increase. Let this faith guide you along the narrow path that leads through the gates of the city into the great beyond, the wide, unbounded future of glory that is for the redeemed. God's Amazing Grace, page 372. Many were the messages of comfort given the church by the prophets of old. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 1 was Isaiah's commission from God and with the commission were given wonderful visions that have been the believer's hope and joy through all the centuries that have followed. Despised of men, persecuted, forsaken, God's children in every age have nevertheless been sustained by His sure promises. By faith they have looked forward to the time when He will fulfill to His church the assurance, I will make thee an eternal excellency, a joy of many generations. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 15. Prophets and Kings, pages 722 and 723. The Father's presence encircled Christ, and nothing befell him but that which infinite love permitted for the blessing of the world. Here was his source of comfort, and it is for us. He who is imbued with the Spirit of Christ abides in Christ. Whatever comes to him comes from the Savior who surrounds him with his presence. Nothing can touch him except by the Lord's permission. All our sufferings and sorrows, all our temptations and trials, all our sadness and griefs, all our persecutions and privations, in short, all things work together for our good. All experiences and circumstances are God's workmen whereby good is brought to us. The Ministry of Healing, pages 488 and 489. Sunday, February 14. Comfort for the Future The pride of Assyria and its fall are to serve as an object lesson to the end of time. Of the nations of earth today who in ignorance and pride array themselves against him, God inquires, To whom art thou thus like in glory and in greatness among the trees of Eden? Yet shalt thou be brought down with the trees of Eden unto the nether parts of the earth. Verse 18. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. But with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of all who endeavor to exalt themselves above the Most High. Nahum chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. Prophets and Kings, page 366. That heart is the happiest that has Christ as an abiding guest. That home is the most blessed where godliness is a controlling principle. In the workshop where the peace and heavenly presence of Christ dwells, the workers will be the most trustworthy, the most faithful, and the most efficient. The fear and love of God are seen. In this world, there is neither comfort nor happiness without Jesus. Let us acknowledge Him as our friend and Savior. In Him are matchless charms. Oh, may we all so live during this brief period of probationary time that we shall reign with Him throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity.
My Life Today, page 157. It is your privilege to trust in the love of Jesus for salvation in the fullest, surest, noblest manner. To say, He loves me, He receives me, I will trust Him, for He gave His life for me. Nothing so dispels doubt as coming in contact with the character of Christ. He declares him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. That is, there is no possibility of me casting him out, for I have pledged my word to receive him. Take Christ at his word, and let your lips declare that you have gained the victory. Is Jesus true? Does he mean what he says? Answer decidedly, yes, every word then if you have settled this, by faith claim every promise that he has made and receive the blessing, for this acceptance by faith gives life to the soul. You may believe that Jesus is true to you, even though you feel yourself to be the weakest and most unworthy of his children. And as you believe, all your dark brooding doubts are thrown back upon the arch deceiver who originated them. You can be a great blessing if you will take God at his word. By living faith, you are to trust him, even though the impulse is strong within you to speak words of distrust. Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 517. The season of distress and anguish before us will require a faith that can endure weariness, delay, and hunger. A faith that will not faint, though severely tried. The period of probation is granted to all to prepare for that time. Jacob prevailed because he was persevering and determined. His victory is an evidence of the power of importunate prayer. All who will lay hold of God's promises as he did and be as earnest and persevering as he was will succeed as he succeeded. When waves of despair which no language can express sweep over the suppliant, let us cling with unyielding faith to the promises of God. The Great Controversy Page 621 Monday, February 15 Presence, Word, and Roadwork Anciently, when a king journeyed through the less frequented parts of his dominion, a company of men was sent ahead of the royal chariot to level the steep places and to fill up the hollows that the king might travel in safety and without hindrance. This custom is employed by the prophet to illustrate the work of the gospel. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low. When the Spirit of God, with its marvelous awakening power, touches the soul, it abases human pride. Worldly pleasure and position and power are seen to be worthless. Imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God are cast down. Every thought is brought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5 then humility and self-sacrificing love, so little valued among men, are exalted as a loan of worth. This is the work of the gospel of which John's message was a part. The Desire of Ages, page 135. What is our work? The same as that given to John the Baptist of whom we read, in those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. The word of the Lord to us is, Repent ye, prepare the way for a revival of my work. Obstacles to the advancement of the work of God will appear, but fear not. To the omnipotence of the King of Kings, our covenant-keeping God unites the gentleness and care of a tender shepherd. Nothing can stand in His way. His power is absolute, and it is the pledge of the sure fulfillment of His promises to His people. His goodness and love are infinite, and His covenant is unalterable. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 8, Pages 9 and 10 the infidel Voltaire once boastingly said, I am weary of hearing people repeat that twelve men established the Christian religion. I will prove that one man may suffice to overthrow it. Generations have passed since his death. 
millions have joined in the war upon the Bible. But it is so far from being destroyed that where there were a hundred in Voltaire's time, there are now ten thousand, yes, a hundred thousand copies of the Book of God. In the words of an early reformer concerning the Christian church, the Bible is an anvil that has worn out many hammers. Saith the Lord, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. Isaiah chapter 54 verse 17. The word of our God shall stand forever. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 8. Whatever is built upon the authority of man will be overthrown, but that which is founded upon the rock of God's immutable word shall stand forever. The Great Controversy, page 288. Tuesday, February 16. The Birth of Evangelism. It is the darkness of misapprehension of God that is enshrouding the world. Men are losing their knowledge of His character. It has been misunderstood and misinterpreted. At this time, a message from God is to be proclaimed, a message illuminating in its influence and saving in its power. His character is to be made known. Into the darkness of the world is to be shed the light of His glory, the light of His goodness, mercy, and truth. This is the work outlined by the prophet Isaiah in the words, O Jerusalem, that bringest good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength, lift it up, be not afraid, say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God, behold the Lord God will come with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him, behold his reward is with him, and his work before him. Isaiah chapter 40 verses 9 and 10. Christ's Object Lessons, page 415. The unselfish labor of Christians in the past should be to us an object lesson and an inspiration. The members of God's church are to be zealous of good works, separating from worldly ambition and walking in the footsteps of Him who went about doing good. With hearts filled with sympathy and compassion, they are to minister to those in need of help, bringing to sinners a knowledge of the Savior's love. Such work calls for laborious effort, but it brings a rich reward. Those who engage in it with sincerity of purpose will see souls won to the Savior for the influence that attends the practical carrying out of the divine commission is irresistible. Not upon the ordained minister only rests the responsibility of going forth to fulfill this commission. Everyone who has received Christ is called to work for the salvation of his fellow men. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come. Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. The charge to give this invitation includes the entire church. Everyone who has heard the invitation is to echo the message from hill and valley, saying, Come. The Acts of the Apostles, pages 109 and 110. He calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. The eastern shepherd does not drive his sheep. He depends not upon force or fear, but going before, he calls them. They know his voice, and obey the call so does the Savior shepherd with his sheep. As the shepherd goes before his sheep, himself first encountering the perils of the way, so does Jesus with his people. When he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them. The way to heaven is consecrated by the Savior's footprints. The path may be steep and rugged, but Jesus has traveled that way. His feet have pressed down the cruel thorns to make the pathway easier for us. Every burden that we are called to bear, he himself has borne. The Desire of Ages, page 480. Wednesday, February 17. Merciful Creator. Men of the greatest intellect cannot understand the mysteries of Jehovah as revealed in nature. Divine inspiration asks many questions which the most profound scholar cannot answer. 
These questions were not asked that we might answer them, but to call our attention to the deep mysteries of God and to teach us that our wisdom is limited, that in the surroundings of our daily life there are many things beyond the comprehension of finite beings. Skeptics refuse to believe in God because they cannot comprehend the infinite power by which He reveals Himself. But God is to be acknowledged as much from what He does not reveal of Himself as from that which is open to our limited comprehension. Both in divine revelation and in nature, God has given mysteries to command our faith. This must be so. We may be ever searching, ever inquiring, ever learning, and yet there is an infinity beyond. The Ministry of Healing, page 431. He who has chosen Christ has joined himself to a power that no array of human wisdom or strength can overthrow. To whom then will ye liken me, or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and behold who hath created these things, that bringeth out their host by number. He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power. Not one faileth. Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 25, 26, and 28 to 31. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 8, pages 39 and 40. God calls men to look upon the heavens. See Him in the wonders of the starry heavens. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 26 quoted. We are not merely to gaze upon the heavens, we are to consider the works of God. He would have us study the works of infinity, and from this study learn to love and reverence and obey Him. The heavens and the earth, with their treasures, are to teach the lessons of God's love, care, and power. God calls upon His creatures to turn their attention from the confusion and perplexity around them and admire His handiwork. The heavenly bodies are worthy of contemplation. God has made them for the benefit of man, and as we study His works, angels of God will be by our side to enlighten our minds and guard them from satanic deception. As you look at the wonderful things God's hand has made, let your proud, foolish heart feel its dependence and inferiority. As you consider these things, you will have a sense of God's condescension. Ellen G. White comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 4, page 1145. Thursday, February 18. The Problem with Idolatry In rejecting the truth, men reject its author. In trampling upon the law of God, they deny the authority of the lawgiver. It is as easy to make an idol of false doctrines and theories as to fashion an idol of wood or stone. By misrepresenting the attributes of God, Satan leads men to conceive of him in a false character. With many, a philosophical idol is enthroned in the place of Jehovah, while the living God, as he is revealed in his word, in Christ, and in the works of creation, is worshipped by but few. Thousands deify nature while they deny the God of nature. Though in a different form, idolatry exists in the Christian world today as verily as it existed among ancient Israel in the days of Elijah. The God of many professedly wise men, of philosophers, poets, politicians, journalists, the God of polished fashionable circles, is little better than Baal, the sun god of Phoenicia. The Great Controversy Page 583. All false worship is spiritual adultery. The second precept which forbids false worship is also a command to worship God and Him only serve. The Lord is a jealous God. He will not be trifled with. He has spoken concerning the manner in which He should be worshipped. 
He has a hatred of idolatry, for its influence is corrupting. It debases the mind and leads to sensuality and all kinds of sin. Ellen G. White comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 1, page 1106. He who searches the heart desires to win his people from every species of idolatry. Let the word of God, the blessed book of life, occupy the tables now filled with useless ornaments. Spend your money in buying books that will be the means of enlightening the mind in regard to present truth. The time you waste in moving and dusting the multitudinous ornaments in your house, spend in writing a few lines to your friends and sending papers or leaflets or little books to someone who knows not the truth. Grasp the word of the Lord as the treasure of infinite wisdom and love. This is the guidebook that points out the path to heaven. It points us to the sin-pardoning Savior, saying, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. John chapter 1, verse 29. Oh, that you would search the Scriptures with prayerful hearts and a spirit of surrender to God. Oh, that you would search your hearts as with a lighted candle and discover and break the finest thread that binds you to worldly habits which divert the mind from God. Plead with God to show you every practice that draws your thoughts and affections from Him. God has given His holy law to man as His measure of character. By this law you may see and overcome every defect in your character. You may sever yourself from every idol and link yourself to the throne of God by the golden chain of grace and truth. Selected Messages, Book 2, page 318. For further reading, Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, An Exalted Privilege, pages 478 to 480, and Testimonies for the Church, Conflicts and Victory, Volume 1, pages 608 and 609.